piece that I've been planning on reading for student faculty for a while. And then I finally got around to timing it the other day and it was like 14 minutes. So this is a, so this is a piece that I have that has been published. I'm gonna put it in a link in the chat. I'm doing an excerpted version, um, but you're welcome. And I encourage you in fact, to uh, go check out the thing if it speaks to you. Uh, the title is On the Importance of Looking. I think everybody wants to be objectified just a little bit. Not dehumanized, stripped of personhood, not coarsely, not cruelly, but seen as an object of desire, a thing worth having. I remember hands on me like I was a side of meat the first time I went to a gay bar, or the first time I went to a gay bar with the intention of being touched, seen, desired. I was 19 and it was a real bash, the occasion of a charity benefit in a converted warehouse space in the heart of Austin, Texas. The walls were hung with distasteful sculpture, gaudy Warhol-esque portraits and woodblock prints of tied up men, faces contorted in some kind of ecstasy, some kind of agony. On the little patio outside, Ivy crawled up brick walls, penned in on three sides. It wasn't my first time sneaking into a venue on false pretenses but it was my most audacious. A friend and I talked our way past the door without showing ID with the cover story that we were last minute replacements for the no-show models on the guest list. He ended up on stage midway through the night, posing like he was born for it while artists sketched and sculpted. I melted into the crowd, tearing off the name tag that labeled me a model as soon as I was through the front door. I was there to be seen, consumed, but not laid bare on the page. I avoided the bar, the drinks were free and IDs were being checked at the door, but what if someone asked? The trays going around the room carried by fit young men in jock straps covered in plastic shot glasses shaped like genderless asses and filled with something neon and strong, those felt safe and I stuffed the glasses in my pockets like a magpie building a nest from souvenirs. Yellow, orange, red, all the colors of a sunset, candy sweet and whiskey strong. On other nights, I had talked my way past doormen or jumped fences to see punk bands at venues who had never heard of all ages or to meet up with near strangers who didn't know how young I was or just to get drunk somewhere that wasn't my living room. This party though, this event was my first time going somewhere for no reason other than it was gay and loud and full of people. I don't remember how I was dressed, who I spoke to, but I remember the feeling of moving from the gallery to the bathrooms, to the dance floor and being watched, assessed, considered. I remember being cornered out on the patio by a man with cigarette breath, kissing him until the stale air inside was better company. I remember being touched on my shoulders, my waist, my ass, hands made invisible by the dim lights and press of bodies. The feeling of being wanted was stronger than the drink. I started taking hormones in 2017, started wearing my closet full of dresses out in public on nights other than Halloween. I shaved off my beard, grew my hair out, learned how to blend my eyebrow, eyeshadow and contour my cheekbones. I learned from a girlfriend how to use orange lipstick on my jaw to mask the faint blue tinge of whatever facial hair electrolysis couldn't eliminate. I have a complicated relationship to gender, a complicated relationship to passing as though being mistaken for cis is my highest calling, but I can at least look the world in the eyes and say I am a woman. Some, most of the time, the world listens. Some of the time it agrees. The way that gay men look at you, watch you, when, when, you, when they want you can be crude sometimes, frightening if you're not accustomed to it. Despite that, being cruised carries a level of subtlety that's always made it feel safer and less threatening to me than when it comes from straight men. Gay men look at me like they're hungry for me a lot less frequently than they used to. When I haven't hidden my beard shadow as well as I like, when my clothes are a little too bulky to see the shape of me, they do. And the looks are still a little flattering, but it's not thrilling, not electric like it used to be. They're missing information. They see a version of myself that hasn't really existed for years, the version of me with an M for male on her driver's license and a deep well of discomfort kept under lock and key. I always wanna walk right up when they're watching me, cruising me, break the thin membrane of plausible deniability and say, if you knew what you were actually looking at, you'd be a lot less interested, but I never do. 
when I started wearing dresses, I started carrying a knife. I started watching for a different kind of threat. When men cat call each other, grab each other's wrists, waste asses in the crush of a dance floor, or follow each other into bathrooms, they're on equal footing. Sexual violence exists among gay men, but by and large, the power dynamic is playful, ebbing and flowing. The subtlety of queer courtship puts a soap bubble thin membrane around leering, staring, grabbing, cruising. Plausible deniability means denial is possible. I'm still afraid of homophobes and transphobes with half empty beers in their cars, but despite too many close calls with their kind, they never felt like a threat I couldn't handle. Now I'm afraid of men with desire, desire that twists too easily into cruelty. Simple rejection can be enough to turn a leering stare into a closed fist to say nothing of the reaction some men have to finding out they're interested in a woman like me. I haven't learned to sit with the fear just yet how to protect myself from it, so I protect myself from the men instead. I carry my knife strapped to my thigh under my dress. I wear my bike's U-lock and my belt like a carpenter's hammer. Thank you.